Okay, so we've got 11 people, good. All right, welcome everyone. And thanks for joining the prevention session, um, strategic priority four. We're going to start just with a question to you. So you'll, you know the drill, no? To go to the link in the chat. And the question is, why did you decide to join this session um, on prevention? So just let and us know. As you're filling that in. out, just in case you don't know Susan and I, although I'm sure oh. um, most of you, I think, do, I'll just let me introduce ourselves. <laughs> uh, so I'm Selena Jensen. I'm the focal point for the assessment, measurement, and evidence working group of the Alliance. And I'm Susan Wisniewski. I'm the prevention focal point uh, with the Alliance. So welcome, everybody. So now you can go. It's a group map link. I hope we're all familiar with it now. Okay, it's because it's an exciting priority. <laughs> Sorry, the because wasn't supposed to be posted yet. That was me. <laughs> Just because. <laughs> we, 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 could have, we could have tricked everybody and said enter, type something in, but don't hit enter. And then everybody hit enter at the same time and watch it all disappear. <laughs> It is the number one priority. I'm sure people could have a fight about that. But they're all equal. That's an important one. I think because it's my favorite. It's, it's a bit like obviously because. <laughs> obviously. <laughs> okay. So I'm just okay. aware that a couple of people are just joining. So, um, so welcome, welcome. I'm just going to add in to the chat box um, um, a link, and you can Great, choose. Thanks, the, the, there's no worries, no worries. Uh, you can choose the appropriate link. And the, the question is, is why did you select this session on prevention today? So it's a quick check-in round, if you like, to make sure that you know we're all okay, we're all here. And I see someone has read the position paper because they've quoted the quote at the beginning. That might have been me. <laughs> right. <laughs> There's a little bit of cheating. <laughs> Any other reasons? Um, oh, I didn't um, see the David hasn't seen the it should the be just above chat. your message. Is it in the chat box, Susan? It's in the chat box, yes. Okay, for some reason I don't. Okay, let me do you see it? Again. Do you see it's it? Now got, it's got box? the three languages. Matt just resent it. And you can click on any of the links in either language, it'll take you to the same place. So, just why did you decide to join this session? A major shift in thinking and ways of working. Yes. That's the aim. Hopefully yeah. that will be the result of some of what's come out of this this week. And welcome to those of you who are just joining us. The last frontier of our work. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for that as well. <laughs> yeah, there's been like it's a long week on prevention, so we're happy yes, to stay we, we we assumed we might have the fewest people this week since there's so many interesting discussions happening at the same time, and Susan and I have already kind of been presenting this week and we thought maybe maybe participants would like to join other discussions. I think the best way to phrase it though, Lena and Susan, is that this is an exclusive conversation. It's, it's, mm -hmm. not, it's not the smallest, it's the exclusive conversation. Um, I, I've just realized that somebody else has just joined. So um, welcome, we're just doing a quick check-in round. Um, 
there's a link in the chat function if you just wanted to you know drop in your response to the question that Selena and Susan have asked around kind of why did you select this priority session on prevention today so welcome um, and uh, yeah feel free to put in what you think before we move on so maybe just um, a minute and then we can move on to to start Yes, and certainly with a smaller group, we can um, hopefully have some thoughtful discussions today. No problem, come in. So shall we move okay. um, on to the PowerPoint? And maybe in the, um, as we're um, just putting the PowerPoint up, if you would like to, since it is a smaller group, we invite you, I think many of you do have your cameras on, so that's great. Um, if you're comfortable in the bandwidth permits, please do turn on your camera so we can all see each other. Um, and if you also wanted to rena uh, rename yourself, I think today um, we'll be sticking to English for this discussion, but if you wanted to add your the agency you work for in your rename or um, your um, position or the country you're calling in from, it's just a nice and quick way for us to get to know each other a little bit. Um, I'll put the, so welcome everybody. Um, and thank you for joining us. We'll, um, I'll just go through how this session is broken down. So we'll be engaging in, um, in a discussion group. We have a few different questions that are, um, have been prepared for you. So we'll go be turning back to group map to discuss those. Uh, we'd really like to look at um, the ways forward for the Alliance and um, what the Alliance should be and engaging with and who they should be engaging with in terms of moving forward with this priority. Um, and, and we'll be ranking those as well. So there's kind of a lot of interactive um, discussion that will happen. Um, and, then, and then we'll come back and, and discuss them. And we'll, we'll stay in plenary, I think, since we are a smaller group today. Um, so I think you probably know the drill by now. Um, having, I'm assuming, participated in other sessions already the last couple of days. Um, so feel free to um, yeah, unmute yourself and speak, or, or also you can write in the chat. Susan and I will be monitoring. Um, and then, yeah, if you have any background noise, just um, make sure that your, your mute is on. And I think that's about it for ground rules. So I'm sure that many of you have um, been in the previous discussion and um, we just wanted to quickly go over the goal of the prevention priority um, in the Alliance's new strategy. So as I'm sure you all know, prevention is understood and prioritized as a critical element of child protection across humanitarian action, um, which is why it's been prioritized for the theme of this year's annual meeting. Next slide. And the key objectives are to promote increased prioritization of prevention funding and programming, including generating evidence on prevention as a cost-saving and life-saving intervention, um, to grow knowledge, capacity, and understanding within the child protection sector, and to engage with other sectors, which I think we have been hearing a lot of um, during this last couple of days as well. So as, as I'm sure many of you are aware, Susan and I have been mentioning this on Monday um, and speaking a little bit more about the wider prevention initiative. So we just wanted to highlight some of the work that has been achieved so far. Um, the AIM working group has been supporting the prevention initiative, which is why I'm also co-facilitating this, this discussion. 
Um, but over the last year and a half, we have developed a report um, which focuses on understanding risk and protective factors in humanitarian crises. And this really um, highlights some of the key, we were trying to synth synthesize uh, risk and protective factors linked to specific harmful outcomes for children. So it really highlights some of the common or universal risk and protective factors that we were seeing across different um, fields and disciplines, as well as um, some of the um, some of the determinants of outcomes for children. So um, I, I believe those have been placed in the chat and I would encourage you or Catherine, if you can um, place all the links to these doc resources in the chat so all of you have access to them if you haven't had a chance to look at them yet. Um, and then in addition to that, we have um, a brief guidance document on how to identify risk and, and rank risk and protective factors. Um, oh, if you could go back, yeah. Um, we have, oh, if you could go back to the last slide. Um, we have uh, a brief, um, which highlights, it's more practical brief, which was linked to the report um, on implications for programming. And then we had a, a desk review synthesis for the wider prevention framework that is being developed and led by Susan. Um, and then last but not least, as I'm sure you have all read, hopefully, is the position paper on prevention. So there's a lot of work that has been achieved so far, a lot of resources that are um, really important. Um, they're all quite short. So I would encourage you all to take a look at those and share them with your colleagues. Next slide, thanks. And over to you, okay. Susan. Yeah, thanks. So, and that was the list of kind of resources and, and um, documents developed already. There's one more ongoing, which is the, the framework of action for primary prevention. Um, and so this is more around providing guidance on key actions, key considerations throughout the programming cycle. So really um, focusing on, on program management and how would you um, start and implement and evaluate uh, primary prevention programming in particular. Can go to the next slide. Um, and so this, if you were on the session on Monday, you've already seen it, but this is kind of how the, the framework is structured around the program cycle. Um, and then we'll go try to give program managers and practitioners um, key things to be making sure um, they're considering and implementing at each step. Um, and then if we go to the next slide, We'll see that a big focus um, and what Selena shared that's already been done is a lot of work on understanding risk and protective factors and the tool that was developed on how to identify and rank them with communities um, because the main foundation is how do we increase protective factors to reduce the likelihood of harm and then how do we do re reduce risk factors um, and these two together is what is going to lead to prevention of harm to children. So today, um, in this session, on this first session, we're going to be focusing on exactly that piece of the puzzle, um, which is in the second objective within the, the priority on what are the strategies and approaches. And this has to start with how are we um, how are we understanding risk and, and um, yeah, protective factors? And how are we going forward um, to act on our, our understanding and prioritization of them? Um, so that's the, the focus of this session. And so really on the strategies and approaches, and then how do we um, take those forwards in terms of capacity, knowledge generation, et cetera. Um, and I just wanted to say one thing because um, this is this session is concurrent with the other 
three priorities, but they're really so interlinked with prevention. Um, and the other three are really also foundations for, for prevention that it would be great to have in mind as we're thinking and um, working across sectors, localization, uh, meaningful participation, accountability are all um, integral to prevention. So it would be great as we're thinking if we can also think how are we going to link with the other priorities um, to take prevention forward. Okay, so now I think we're going to switch to our activity and there will be the link to the group map to start us off on the first brainstorming that we'll do together. And feel free just to, um, you know, unmute yourselves um, and intervene as well. There in the link you can find, I mean, in the chat, you can find the link to the group map. See some results are coming in. Thank you. So barriers to identifying risk and protective factors in humanitarian settings. So I will zoom out slowly as people start to add in and I can see that it's filling up very quickly. So I'll scroll down for you as well, if it makes it easier to be able to keep up. So just another minute or so, if anyone's got anything additional they'd like to add. I'm seeing short time, um, lack of knowledge. And of course, if you're unable to uh, uh, use uh, um, the group map that we're using, you can submit into the chat as well, and uh, we'll add it add this in for you later on. Um, could you scroll back up to the top? Because I think that's where the new entries are showing up. Of course. Hi, Matt. I think you can click the, the question bar and then show full screen to only show that box, the blue box. Oh, and if we could just, um, we're gonna stick with question one. I see someone is eager to get to question two. Jumping on fast. Yes. So what we'll do is um, discuss together uh, question one and then some of the ways forward and then uh, in step three, we will, um, we'll, we will, we would like to hear from you what the alliance should be prioritizing in terms of the ways forward or solutions, and then who the alliance should be prioritizing working with um, to advance prevention work. So we'll kind of go through each step, and we'll we'll be able to rank um, questions three and four as well. Absolutely. There's still a few more being added and I can see some of these just joining the group as well. So Catherine, if you can share the link again for our uh, newcomers. And um, I see some people are liking. If you agree, uh, you know, you're reading someone else's response and you agree with it, you can go ahead and like it as well. Mm. Um, just to show that, yeah, that's a good point. Absolutely. Thank you. So welcome if you are just joining us. We're just in a brainstorming activity. Um, Catherine has shared the link into the chat for you. If possible, if you can click on that link, uh, you'll be greeted with uh, 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 into a group map. And the question that we would like you to respond to is number one only, and that is what are the barriers to identifying risk and protective factors in humanitarian settings? So if you've got anything you'd like to submit, or if you would like to just look at what other people have submitted, um, we're just um, reviewing it and sort of plus oneing, giving giving things a thumbs up if you like, and then a short discussion before moving on. Yeah, Selena, maybe we can already start to go through yeah. the responses. And if anyone yeah. would like to unmute themselves and speak up or or explain what they have written down that is welcome as well. We'd really like to make this as participatory as possible. So please do speak up. Um, so uh, one thing I'm seeing is 
uh, of course, related to assessment, um, not having the tools to identify risk and protective factors, not sy systematically identifying risk and protective factors in our preparedness work. Um, focus on multi-sectoral assessments that don't go into detail, uh, too complex, too many factors, um, and um, this point is interesting and I see people are liking it that, uh, that the, the beneficiaries and community members, children that we're engaging with are not empowered to meaningfully participate uh, when surveys and assessments do occur. Would anyone like to speak to any of those points? Um, I'll speak to maybe the, yeah. Yeah, maybe it was the same. It was actually the um, the first point that, um, or the most recent point. I think that's really interesting that we do not always rely enough on what we know going into a humanitarian context and try to do too much. And um, I don't know, that just rang true for me that we often have like, a, sometimes it feels like a fear of acting. Um, and so I think, yeah, that's for me, that's, um, uh, a really useful point and when we think about how to address that, um, that that's a tough one but it would be interesting so it's just I like that one yeah I think we often um, jump into facilitating an assessment when we do have there are there there generally is um, a lot of data that's available um, and data from other sectors that we could be engaging with other sector colleagues, as opposed to uh, rushing out and facilitating assessments. So really looking at the secondary data first and ensuring that desk reviews have been completed um, prior to um, facilitating assessments, because there is a lot of existing information and data that will be available. And we can already make assumptions, um, even just given the the humanitarian context, if it's a displacement context, for instance, that itself is a risk factor. Um, so we can look at kind of the wider context, secondary data, and really pull out um, what some of the risk and protective factors are just from doing that. So it doesn't have to be as complex um, all the time as I think we might think it is. Um, I think sometimes we, we rush out to respond when there is existing information and we can um, discuss and engage with community members and caregivers and children to um, with simple exercises like focus group discussions um, if the context if, um, allows for that um, to identify what they were doing prior to the emergency situation and trying to understand what protective mechanisms and systems were in place um, prior to the humanitarian situation. So um, I think sometimes it's often maybe taking a step back and just speaking to the preparedness point, that's something of course, in terms of reviewing secondary data, um, collaborating across um, other sectors that we, can, we, we should be and can be doing in the preparedness phase to have some um, documentation of existing risk and protective factors. Um, would anyone else like to raise a key point that they added here? Can I just um, add to that because, because sorry, whoever I cut off, <laughs> because those were my points, but actually both of them, this idea about the prepare, from preparedness and also this idea about not really relying enough on what we already know. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, the whole idea behind, and Susan sort of knows this, I think from the comments that I've given to the development of the prevention <laughs> framework is, uh, I really think preparedness is key, really key uh, to, to so much. If we're really going to make this, um, if we're really going to make prevention a priority and to make it 
and to make it work. There's so many issues that we're working on. I know that not all humanitarian contacts and settings are the same, but in, in many of them, particularly I'm, you know, I'm thinking like rapid sort of onset that might be very large sorts of humanitarian uh, situations that we don't have the luxury of time if we want to get to prevention. Trafficking happens in the first two weeks. Child labor happens in the first two weeks. Even within the language of our SGBV minimum standard, we must assume that STV is happening. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying that we don't need to do any contextual analysis, of course, but I think we need to learn the lessons of assess and do at the, at the same time as, as much as possible. For those of you who were involved in the high-end response in the Philippines a few years back now, we'll know that that was like one of the key, key sort of learnings that came out, uh, particularly because it was coming from a lot of communities and that why are so many people coming and asking us lots of questions, but not really doing anything? So, thank you. Yeah, thanks, David. Very important um, points raised there. And I think one, th one, something we have discussed at the Alliance and kind of at the very beginning of some of this work was how do we document risk and protective factors um, better, which would happen in the preparedness phase. Um, we really wanted to develop kind of a typology framework because we can see that um, in cyclical natural disasters, for instance, we often see, for example, um, in Haiti, we'll see every year there's, there are hurricanes. We see a decrease in school attendance following a hurricane, an increase in child labor, um, in protracted crises, conflict um, crises. When the, when the conflict situation moves, we can see as soon as the conflict moves, there's um, increase in sexual violence. So we could really be documenting um, what some of the risk and protective factors are. Um, so we're prepared knowing that um, there will be another hurricane next year and in a protracted conflict situation, that conflict might move to another location so that we're pre preparing and documenting some of these risk and protective factors um, in, in the preparedness phase. So that's um, very, very good point and speaking a little bit now about the ways forward. So maybe we can move on to that question and please um, add in your responses to ways forward, um, both in general or kind of in response to some of what has been raised in question one. Yeah, I'm just gonna highlight this for you all so you can see the full screen. So hopefully it'd be easier to view as we go on. As, uh, as, as Selena and Susan shared, you know, what are some of the ways forward or solutions to address these barriers? So capacity building. Making identification of factors more systematic. Again, the participation and engagement with communities. Actually, can I ask, because I've heard this a few times this week, um, I think from Tasha just earlier and Hani earlier in the week, the no regrets basis. Um, can you maybe just explain what that means? For me, at least. So either for me, I've anyone, never it. yeah. <laughs> or Hani and Tasha, I think you both used it this week. So either, either one. you want to go. Go for it, Hani. No, it's actually that's my that's the point that I put <laughs> in there. So uh, it is. Uh, it's basically there. If, if there are certain things that you know are going to take place. Um, this, the idea is the idea of no reg, no regrets basis is that you op, you operate on that assumption that they're going to happen, even if 
you are proven wrong in retrospect. Um, and that's, I think that's to the point that David was making earlier, that in some situations we have enough learning from the previous context. We know what the typical negative outcomes that come out are. Um, for example, population movement happens, children are separated. Um, conflict starts, sexual violence goes up, um, or children are, are going to start getting recruited. Now, you can start operating on that assumption and try to address some of the root, known root causes of those while you're also hopefully doing an, a more in-depth assessment in, in the context and understanding the more nuanced contextual um, elements that can then refine and help help refine your program, but waiting until until those things are are completely known and they're fully contextualized probably means that many children will be separated or many sexual cases of sexual violence will take place. I don't know, Tasha, if you have a different notion on that or you agree with that. Perhaps I could just compliment by saying how many times we've been um, asked for more data in order to invest in something, right? So we need more data on the violations. We need more data on gender-based violence um, rather than recognizing the evidence, as Hani said, that we know that's happening. And so investing um, on a no regrets basis um, is also, um, it's not only just until proven wrong, it's 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 rather recognizing that this is already known and, and that's accepted. Um, and therefore we're going to invest um, ahead of time. I think the challenge that we're going to see is to then measure the impact of that investment in terms of prevention. Um, and I think that'll be you know a very exciting new frontier for us to be able to to demonstrate what that investment has um, um, resulted in for children and their caregivers. Um, but it's certainly something that we've been pushing. And just to give an example in UNICEF with our new emergency procedures, that's very much at the forefront of investing on a no regrets basis at the outset of any humanitarian um, response, because we know, and it's been proven again and again and again, um, what the impacts are for children. Thanks. Thanks to you both. Does anyone else have anything they would like to add? Um, yeah, I, I do actually. I kind of, I wanted to kind of take a moment to bring this back to the communities that we're working with as well. Um, in the first question, as well as this one, points that have been raised is like, how can we better engage with the communities? And I think we need to remember that for a prevention approach to be sustainable, we need to be working with the communities that are ultimately going to be moving this forward and understanding you know what are their priority risk factors what are their priority pr protective factors and you know we can rely on desk reviews we can rely on us leading assessments but ultimately to have a real understanding of what can be an effective prevention approach in a specific area we need to actually be engaging with communities and thinking about how can we make that and i know that i, I know in a sudden onset emergency you don't necessarily have the luxury of time to, to sit and engage in a deep contextual analysis with communities, but we need to be thinking about ways that we can have those voices and meaningfully have those voices, not just community leaders, but um, people in the communities who may not have their voices heard in order to really actually understand how do we prevent harm from happening. Um, and so I just, I recognize that natural tension between having an emergency response um, and needing to, to do and not just assess, but assess and do, but in order to actually have a tailored response that will naturally build existing protective factors and address those risk factors, it needs to be in cooperation with communities. And I think that kind of goes back to the previous point around preparedness as well, is that really engaging and building relationships with communities from the start. But, and I just want to again, emphasize that when I say communities, it can't just be community leaders because they don't necessarily always represent the interests of an entire community. And communities can be many different things. It's not necessarily just one population in a specific area. There's communities within that location and really being strategic in that regard. And that does take time and energy and effort, but it, it will ultimately lead to a better prevention approach. 
Thanks, Michelle. Absolutely agree. Would anyone like to, to speak to that further? Um, what was interesting to me with um, Sorry, just oh, Michelle, can I just write that it's not exactly on the list here. Can I just write about building the relationships with communities in the preparedness phase? Can I just add that? I don't want to lose it. <laughs> Go ahead, Selena. <laughs> um, what was interesting for me during the desk review for the prevention framework, uh, when we were kind of looking at documented risk factors, um, that were linked to specific harmful outcomes for children, such as separation and, and recruitment and child labor. Um, we were also looking at documented protective factors and there were very few um, documented protective factors. And I thought it really kind of speaks to how we're very um, you know, response focused. We look at what the problem is and respond to the problem as opposed to of stopping and engaging with community members to try to determine and ask them what are the protection protective systems in place what were you doing when something you know bad happened prior to the emergency and looking at how we can build off of those and strengthen those um, based on based on what communities tell us so it's such an important point and really doesn't need to be that time consuming actually there go ahead yes yeah, sorry also just wanted to emphasize that there are tools available to do this as well so like the reflective field guide um, that was released by the community level child protection task force that i conveniently co-lead so here's a convenient plug for our resources but this reflective field guide really does walk you through how to do this contextual analysis and understand existing protective mechanisms within communities so we do have resources and tools out there and it's really about and I think this is something that has been great about the prevention framework that you know the work done so far is really mapping to existing resources and kind of building on you know what do we already have available and, and how can we just use these more systematically yeah thanks for pointing that out Michelle um, and actually if you wanted to add the link to that the reflective guide in the chat that would be great um, also with the evidence brief that has been developed for the prevention work, we actually list um, both the reflective guide as well as the guidance document for identifying risk and protective factors and other tools that are already existing, as Michelle said, um, that can be used um, for this work. So is there any, anything else in terms of ways forward or solutions that anyone has written down that they would like to speak to? before we move on to the what we should be prioritizing question. So moving in to the next part of the activity that we're doing together. So we've looked at the barriers. We've talked about them. We're talking about kind of ways forward or solutions to address these barriers. What this next activity is gonna encourage us to do is think about where might the priorities be? Uh, based on some of these ways forward. So what I'm going to invite you to do is, I'm still showing my screen. What I'm going to invite you to do is, as you can see here on number two still, let me just make that bigger for you. You can see that the bars are turned gray here slightly. If you click on each one, you can get an idea of uh, um, what, uh, uh, you get an idea of what we're going to do next. We're going to kind of almost rate it and score it. So for example, building on relationships with, with community on prevention and preparedness phase. If that was to happen, is the impact high or low? And how feasible is this as a suggested prioritization? Is it high or low? So what I'm gonna invite you to do is on your screen, if it's, if it's possible for you to do so, is to go through the suggestions that are suggested some of the ways forward or solutions to these barriers and give them uh, a, a, a ranking essentially based on impact and feasibility. So you should be able to do this. I'm going to give you a bit of time to do it. If you click on the link here, you'll see that it will come up. And then to skip to, you give it a score like that. I won't because it will, it will skew the, the results. But then, um, but then to jump onto the next one, you can see this arrow just here and the next one up here. So you can scroll through, score, 
scroll through and scroll. So if you can do that, that would be great. Um, what that will do is it will give us a, a bit of a prioritization matrix that will help us to sort of focus in our conversation moving forward. The ones that were moved to the third box should also be labeled, right? Are they yeah. repeated? So the highest ones coming in now as people move through the ranking mm -hmm. is, um, let me share my screen. So hopefully people can see what I can see. So obviously as you rank things, other people have a different scoring rank and it will give an aggregate. And so we're getting things coming in in terms of high impact, um, such as building relationships, uh, um, oh, sorry, wrong button. Uh, building relationships with full community on prevention in the preparedness, involvement from the community and capacity building. So those are the three that are coming in top currently. Let me just... Um, So these will be quite dynamic and change as we go along. Did you folks want to start talking about the, the, the what's coming in? Um, yeah, yeah, I think um, I'd like to hear from the participants um, in what ways, kind of breaking those points down a little bit further and in what, what ways, what could the, um, Alliance be doing in terms of, of supporting improved capacity building and the involvement of volunteers from community, uh, building relationships with community on prevention and preparedness. What would you like to see from the Alliance? And we don't actually have um, it's not, not a specific question to write in. So if anyone wants to kind of speak up who ranked those um, as the top or if you have any other suggestions or you could write it in the chat as well. Um. So I'm happy to kind of share one of where I thought that it wasn't super feasible, <laughs> just to kind of maybe play devil's advocate. Um, yeah. So while I agree that making identification of like risk and protective factors like systematic in all assessment tools, I don't know, and I'm assuming that by in all assessment tools, it means like even multi-sectoral assessments. I said that I don't see this as being very feasible, just given the level of coordination and agreement that has to go into making these assessment tools and um, that it can be challenging to, to get even, you know, our key child protection um, questions in there and like a reluctance to necessarily make a multi-sectoral assessment tool too, too, too long and how many different actors you have to coordinate. Um, I just, my thought, maybe this is me being pessimistic. <laughs> um, was that the coordination and like the consensus needed to build to include um, any sort of questions or, or tools around um, identification of risk factors in like a, an assessment tool like that that's not specifically focused on child protection would be challenging. Um, so that's why I said the feasibility would be low. Now, if it's like a, and that's kind of where the trend is going is to make these assessments, you know, useful for all actors rather than specific to one sector or another. Um, so that's why I thought that one might be really challenging and that we might need a specific tool that we do implement. Yeah, that's a really good point. And um, it's certainly something um, that I think we need to work with our other sector colleagues um, on in terms of integrating um, integrating child protection into uh, other sector assessments or facilitating multi-sector assessments. Um, and I think just in terms of multi-sectoral collaboration, there are other sectors that are um, collecting data that can be used by the CP sector that we're just not really engaging with. Um, so I think in terms of 
you know, using data to understand what some of the risk and protective factors are, um, like WFP uh, looks at negative coping strategies. Um, we should really be engaging with that data. So it's not necessarily that we had to add additional questions into um, related to risk and protective factors. I think that that information and data is there. We just need to maybe strengthen our ability to be able to analyze and interpret it and understand what that means in terms of leading to um, specific harmful outcomes. So I've aggregated and ranked and that's where they're sitting currently. So if you can see my screen, the orange bar, it displays the aggregate scoring. So this is the culminative um, scores that people have shared. So is that from top to bottom? Yes. Okay. Is it possible? Oh, I guess you can't really enlarge it. Um, so it looks like, okay, operate on the no regrets basis, systematic desk review, um, one emergencies. Um, yeah, if not existing before, certainly that's kind of what we're speaking to is ensuring that that is the secondary data is collected and reviewed um, prior um, at the very beginning to be more strategic in terms of how we engage with communities. So then in terms of um, going back to the reiterating the same question, what would you all like to see from the Alliance um, in terms of kind of moving forward with some of these solutions that you have suggested. And who should we be engaging with? I see some of you are adding um, your responses into that last question four already. They're moving too fast. They're moving too fast. Let me just... <laughs> share my screen so yeah uh, and who should the alliance uh, uh, work with as we move forward in advancing prevention work so just like before this is uh, no need to kind of score as such it's more just if you can see the plus button here you can add in who your who or what organization your suggestion might be so i see engaging um, more with religious, faith-based organizations, more interaction with donors, uh, professionals working in prevention um, through organizing forums. Certainly, I think we can learn from other fields working in prevention and kind of understand better how we can translate uh, learning and knowledge to the CPHA sector. Again, donors, yeah, other sectors like livelihoods, education, WASH. So basically many um, different actors. Maybe just to ask about media, how would, what type of media would we work with? I'm always putting, I'm putting the answers on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Or you could just clarify in the chat. Okay. So mass media and using social media. Um, I was, so I, I didn't put these in, but I was just, when I was reading through these suggestions, I think in advancing prevention work, like, oh, so I agree with the other sectors. Um, I think that's really key. And then I see advocating with donors they're like are working with donors twice and I think what's really key to emphasize here is just like with working with multi-sector partners like with other sectors we also need to think about how we're approaching donors in the same way like there's some donors who are very focused on child protection and who are already on board with prevention as a priority but I think looking at donors who more often support other sectors and why they need to think about having integrated child protection programming and why prevention 
um, which sometimes a, a preventative approach may not be as child protection focused, but so why they need to be incorporating prevention and thinking about child protection and prevention within their programming. So especially with donors who aren't traditional CP donors and who may therefore not be as aware of, of this piece of work, I think is really key. Yes, thanks, thanks Michelle. Um, go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. Oh, you go ahead, Susan. Um, so we've just actually, we're just a minute um, left in the session. So maybe if we can go back to looking at the four squares of the group map just quickly um, to wrap up. Um, and what we're going to do is look at the, how the different solutions were prioritized um, and look at how especially on the feasibility and then the impact and um, look at what could be some concrete actions that the Alliance could take forward in the strategy to promote the, the approaches and um, prevention strategies um, and then link those to, to who we should work with in, in trying to make the, the objectives, the three objectives of the work plan into some concrete actions um, through these solutions. So thank you very much for all of your ideas um, and discussion and um, and ranking of, of what's yeah what would be most useful and what's also possible is very helpful. Um, and we're going to continue this session um, on a slightly different topic, but extending from this into the next uh, 60 minutes, 65 minutes, the next session. So you're welcome to stay in prevention because it will be a slightly different topic or you can go into um, another one. Either way would be fantastic. Um, so yeah, just thank you very much. Lina, do you wanna add anything? No, that's great. So thank you everybody for your participation and for joining this discussion. So if you're just joining us, we have, I think a couple, um, new new people so thank you for joining we're just going to summarize what we did in the last session and if you don't know susan and i i'm selena jensen i'm the focal point for the assessment measurement and evidence working group of the alliance and i've been working um, a lot of the working group has been supporting the work of the prevention initiative so welcome and I'm Susan Wisniewski, Prevention Focal Point with the Alliance. So we're going to have a similar structure to this session um, if you were in the last session, just in terms of having a group map kind of plenary discussion around various questions. These questions will be different than what we discussed in the last session. They kind of carry on um, from that, as Susan mentioned. So we're just going to uh, go through um, quickly the, the priority slides um, for those of you who are new. Um, and uh, we were encouraging, since we're quite a small group, to please unmute yourself and speak up um, if you're comfortable with that, or also you can write in um, if we're in plenary discussion. If you don't feel uh, comfortable doing that, can write in responses into the chat as well. And we're monitoring that to speak to it. Um, also, we'd like to encourage you to turn your, uh, your cameras on if you're comfortable and if your bandwidth permits um, and you can rename yourselves. Um, we're gonna stick to English for this conversation, but if you want to add the country that you're calling in from or your agency you work with or position um, it's just a nice way to get to know each other quickly or even introduce yourself in the chat as well since it's a small group. So just to briefly go over, um, since the strategy was just released um, by the Alliance, that's five-year strategy. Um, this of course is priority four. Um, prevention is understood and prioritized as a critical element of child protection across humanitarian action. Um, which is really why we had decided to prioritize it for this annual meeting this year. And there's three main objectives related to prevention that are included in the strategy, um, which are to promote increased prioritization of prevention funding and programming, 
including generating evidence on prevention, growing knowledge capacity and understanding within the protection sector, child protection sector, and engaging with other sectors on incorporating child protection prevention strategies and approaches. And this also kind of um, will speak to some of the um, points made in the last discussion, but these objectives I think are very much in line with the priorities that came up with our previous discussion. Um, and just for those of you who are joint, just joining us um, as some background to the prevention initiative work over the last year and a half, we have developed uh, various resources um, linked to prevention, uh, which we will place in the chat if you are just joining us. Um, so one was a um, looking at risk and protective factors in humanitarian crises. Um, and this kind of involved documenting or looking at documented risk and protective factors across both child protection, but also other fields and disciplines such as um, uh, neurobiology, child developmental science, um, psychology. So it's very interesting to see um, common or universal uh, risk and protective factors that are linked to, to um, children and child development. So you'll find all of this information in this first report. That's that's um, the title of it. It's right there, as well as in the a couple of the documents, um, including the um, a brief we developed on why identifying risk and protective factors is a critical step. Here we were talking in the last session about some resources that already exist, such as the community reflective guide. Um, there's third on the list is identifying and ranking risk and protective factors, a guide. So there are tools that exist to support you um, and your colleagues in identifying risk and protective factors. So I'd encourage you to also take a look at all of these resources. In the, br in the brief specifically, we have listed other existing resources as well, in addition to those listed here. Um, and then there's a report on the prevention framework. And last but not least is the position paper, um, which was released in the lead up to this annual meeting. Um, and over to you, Susan. Thanks, Elena. Welcome back, everyone. Um, so initiative is this last piece of um, the development of the prevention framework of action, which builds on everything that's already been um, completed. And this is, um, and the framework of action is more a guidance for uh, program managers, humanitarian workers, about how they can um, implement uh, primary prevention programming. Um, so from the uh, throughout the complete program cycle. So if we go to the next slide, we can see um, the, the five steps of the program management cycle. And then the framework will provide some key kind of programming points and considerations um, to, to be sure to, to include when you're doing primary prevention programming for child protection in humanitarian action. So that is what is being developed now. And then in this session, we're, and the previous one, we wanna look at how can this priority go forward over the next few years, knowing what we've already done um, or will be completed. Um, and then how do we take that forward? What are the other gaps? Um, and how can we use what's already been built? Okay, and this is just to emphasize that um, that uh, understanding and prioritizing risk and protective factors are is the key and essential to um, prevention programming. And in the last session, just before this, we focused on what were the barriers to, to identifying and understanding risk and protective factors, and then what would be the solutions um, for how we can ensure that we have the, the foundation of primary prevention programming um, in place for, 
as a sector in child protection and then as a humanitarian sector. If we could, I wonder, Catherine or Matt, if we could um, show the group map from the last session, if it's still up. Great. Um, so that was just show what we did in the last session for a few of you who weren't uh, there. So we basically yeah, looked at what were the barriers to identifying risk and protective factors, identified what would be some solutions. And then in this third box um, on the lower left, we prioritized uh, some solutions that the Alliance could take forward. And it was prioritized in terms of what will be the impact of these actions and then are they feasible? Um, so we've come up with these four, the top four, you can see in the third box, um, operating on a no regrets basis. So using the knowledge that um, we have and we know from experience to take immediate action um, and invest in, in immediate action, um, even if it turned out in the future that that's, um, it wasn't the case or not, we would still invest in it because we know that there's a high chance that this is going to um, help prevent different harms, the actions that have already been identified in our, our body of um, experience and, and um, evidence. Second, to be more strategic in how we engage with communities and meaningful participation, and then have an equal focus on prevention at preparedness level. And that came out a lot in the discussion to really focus on um, investing more in prevention in the preparedness stage and setting the ground for understanding risk and protective factors in preparedness, um, and then building relationships with communities, again, at the preparedness phase. And then we looked a bit at who we would work with to do these things. Um, and that's where we left off. So now we're gonna take one step forward and also look at was the first uh, object objective within the priority, which is that we want prevention to be more of a priority um, among, among the humanitarian community, among child protection actors, among donors. Um, and to do that, we know that we need to generate evidence. So we're gonna look at what can we do, what mechanisms can we put into place to, to generate evidence around prevention. So we're gonna do a similar process by going through the group map steps. Um, and we'll start with the first um, the question on the group map, but maybe I'll stop there. Are there any questions or comments up until now or anything I missed in the summary that someone wants to, to make sure is added? Good stuff. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're both all trying to talk. Catherine, go for it. Sorry. So basically what we're going to ask you to do first is um, if you can see on the um, left of Matt's screen, the blue box. Matt, if I could just ask you to make that uh, bigger. Um, I've dropped the link to this into the chat. So if everyone could click on that and um, you'll be able to pull this up on your own screens. And there you can add on the plus, uh, on that little plus maybe, Matt, you could just hover your mouse over the plus um, gray bar. You can add your point on what are the mechanisms needed to generate and share learning and evidence on effective primary prevention programming. So we're gonna give you um, a minute or so just to add your thoughts there, and then I'll guide you through the next step. Yeah, I think we'll we'll then take a pause and discuss. So please um, only write your responses for question 1A mm -hmm. um, right now, and then we'll have a discussion around that and then move on to 1B. In the previous uh, in the previous group, we had some some really eager folks <laughs> jumping across <laughs> to all the boxes. <laughs> so just start with the blue one for now, as Selena said. <laughs> And also just to say, I'm aware that a few people have um, struggled to get access to uh, this, um, this platform, this group maps. If you would like to, I've got the chat function open. And if, if, if you cannot access it, 
please do feel free to drop your suggestions into the chat and I will cut and paste them into there for you. Also feel free to, um, if you have any questions, um, there's probably a few of you wondering the same thing because at the moment the board's looking a little empty so please feel free to to just ask them um yeah don't be shy just um unmute your mic ask your question and and then hopefully we can clarify for everyone so that we can get some of your valuable insights up onto the board i'm sorry maybe my question is very simple but can you specify what do you mean for mechanism Yeah, good question. What do? <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I mean, the question is really um, that we need to to collect evidence on primary prevention being effective. So the mechanism is how do we do that? How do we? And maybe looking at the alliance, how do we, as the alliance, um, ensure that that evidence is being collected and shared? Um, what can we do concretely to do that? So maybe not like one mechanism uh, overall, but what are different actions that could be taken uh, by the Alliance? Or you could also think, you know, at, um, at different levels as well and just specify that by agency or by coordination group as well. And just to note here, we're looking at just um, the effectiveness of, of programming. In the next question, we're going to look at the, the cost effectiveness, but this is more, uh, are we preventing um, children from harm? Are we being effective in preventing? And again, um, if you just want to drop it into the chat rather, um, I'd be happy to add that in on your behalf. So, oh, all of a sudden, People are adding. <laughs> Great. I know there's quite a few of you in here, so 13. I'm sure we'll get a few more responses. And if you, you can also like uh, someone else's response if it's similar. So please, that gives us an idea of how many people agree with what has been added as well. So please feel free to like another response. I'll just take another minute or so. So Catherine is showing on the screen there how to like it. All right, I think we're just gonna give you a 30 seconds more to add your thoughts and um, and then we'll let Selena and, and Susan um, lead the discussion on, on the great insights you've added there. Facilitate the discussion rather. Yeah, it looks like some great inputs. So there's a few mention of conducting research um, both with other agencies, um, across contexts, um, mixed methods research, using both qual qualitative and quantitative research, um, alongside new programs or activities being implemented to really understand better how effective they are. Um, absolutely agree with the, the last or maybe it was the first point that was added that's at the bottom now on having m and &E frameworks um, in place for prevention work. Yeah, generating case studies. This is a great and, and effective, simple way to be sharing learning um, across agencies. Um, surveys to assess um, lessons learned. Mm 
there's a question here on how to measure harm that was not done. Yes, that's some kind of the, the question about prevention programming, improve record keeping and data management. Um, so I'll just stop there and if anyone would like to unmute themselves and maybe speak to one of the points that, that um, you raised, that would be great. When, um, maybe just to add here, recently this, over this last year, um, the Alliance developed a uh, definition of what we mean by evidence, an evidence-based practice in child protection, humanitarian action. So it was um, led by the AIM Working Group of the Alliance. I know there's a couple of you on this call who were involved with that. And we were really kind of emphasizing the importance of evaluation and evaluating um, our work, which doesn't happen all the time. So I see that a lot of the points here, and it kind of also speaks to some of the challenges around um, evaluating work in um, CPHA. Um, so I'd encourage you all to uh, take a look at the AIM Working Group webpage. I'll put it in the chat and uh, and review that document if you haven't. It's a position paper, so it's quite short. Um, but I see many of the points here are, are speaking to you know, the initial step uh, the Alliance has taken, not just specifically for prevention, but really trying to understand and develop some standards around, um, around what we mean by effectiveness and evidence and and how do we do that? ...and analysis framework in place. We do monitor... Uh... Laura, you have your hand up. Yes, uh, thank you and uh, hi colleagues. And uh, sorry for uh, joining late. Um, I really wanted to be part, but um, as many of us running from one meeting to another, so... Um, I'm, oh, I'm no, we... You haven't joined late. We had two two separate sessions, so some people stayed on. So you're you're not late at all. So we're we're yeah, grateful well, you joined us. Good to know. Um, very interesting work. Uh, um, I, I have read some of the papers uh, produced earlier this year, and and I find them extremely relevant and, and exciting. Uh, I'm working with UNICEF on uh, separation and accompanied separated children with uh, the, the HQ uh, team uh, working on uh, children in humanitarian action. So just commenting on, uh, on, on this uh, exercise, uh, I, I think a great start uh, uh, for us to be able to generate knowledge and disseminate it is going to, uh, to agree on, on a simple, straightforward uh, ME framework that we can use to, uh, uh, to argue how effective uh, prevention interventions are uh, so that we do get uh, the attention, the resources, both human and financial uh, resources we need to uh, to scale up uh, uh, that type of work. Thank you. Yes, thanks. It's a really key point in terms of uh, having a framework in place. Um, we had spoken in the last session around a lot around uh, reviewing secondary data that's in place and really data analysis. And I think some of the and capacity development is kind of linked to some of what is being placed in the responses here because um, it's, I think one step having, um, you know, evaluating our program, having a framework in place, facilitating research and data collection, um, around our programming to determine what is and isn't effective. Um, and really kind of speaking to some of the points raised in the last session um, on capacity development, I think there's a need in the sector to improve our ability to interpret 
um, data that is collected was kind of moving one step um, beyond some of the responses here. Um, so that's something that was raised in the last session as well and very much linked to this. So I think maybe um, unless anyone else has a key, we've key got point. A, we've got a hand up oh, from sorry. David and then after David, Camilla. So go ahead, David. I just wanted to make a call. I mean, I'm certainly in favor of the idea of, you know, strengthening the uh, ME or meal frameworks that we have around the prevention work. But I just kind of a posing a question back to everybody who's here right now. I wonder if the best way to do that is really to kind of make it separate from the rest of the protection work that we're doing, uh, you know, in a, in a sense, maybe creating a parallel kind of a monitoring, monitoring framework. Um, I see advantages of doing that, but I also see disadvantages of doing that and that it kind of separates the two out. And I think that probably we need to look internally a little bit for those of you who uh, use the, <laughs> the minimum standards uh, indicators, how many of them are prevention oriented? Um, I argue not very many. Uh, Quite frankly, so I, I don't know. It's just, I'm. It's something that I'm questioning in my in my head about. Uh, again, I'm very much in favor of a kind of strengthening overall framework, but what's the best approach to do that? Thank you. Yeah, that's a really great question. I'd love to hear some other thoughts by those of you on the call. Hello. Um... Did you want us to pick up on that point or should I share? Anything, yeah, and whatever you like. <laughs> I, very interesting points raised so far, so thank you for those. Um, I was just reflecting a bit and I do apologise, I haven't been able to attend as much of this week's sessions as I'd like, so I might have misinterpreted uh, the work stream, but I did have a little look before the meeting at the paper, so hopefully I'm not too offbeat. Um, as I understand it, we, we're going to need to work with other sectors and also development actors um, uh, in order to make this prevention initiative work, because it's obviously quite large scale and long term and perhaps you know, dipping more into those areas than it would be a child protection specific kind of uh, initiative as such. So um, with that in mind, I think looking at the knowledge generation and m &E points that we've already put down, we need to really work out how we can both capture what those actors are doing but also make it an accessible initiative to them because i've found in the past that when doing sort of mainstream and mainstreaming initiatives people can get quite quickly put off because they see us as one of many added extras that they have to incorporate and you know if you don't keep it simple they they can be put off um and then equally, I was sort of thinking about local actors and some of the prevention initiatives that can be uh, sustainable and long term being being done at community and local level and how we could make sure that the, any frameworks that are developed could could also incorporate inputs from those levels rather than just those who've got the capacity to engage heavily in, in, in these kind of initiatives and, and coordination mechanisms. So there's just a couple of thoughts I was having as we were putting down our ideas. Um, Great, thanks. Does anyone want? I'm just going to yeah, add yeah. the point to the list as well, just to make sure it's captured in the map. Sorry, go ahead. So, does anyone have any other would like to speak to any of those points raised? Um. Yeah, I think it's an interesting question, firstly, of you know, looking at prevention and response as separate, having separate frameworks when they're so linked. And in the last um, discussion, we were talking about risk and protective factors, which you know, we've been discussing in relation to prevention work, but in fact, we should really be looking at risk and protective factors, documenting that across both prevention and response programming and evaluating the effectiveness of, um, of all of our programmings, regardless of whether they're prevention or response. So it's an interesting question whether to separate that or kind of look at kind of everything more um, holistically. And I think just speaking to the integration of 
um, Camilla, your points around integrated work and working across different sectors. We, <clears throat> I think kind of are speaking to that in relation to pillar four of the minimum standards um, on a programmatic level, but we should also be looking at it from you know, the assessment phase and in terms of um, not just incorporating questions, because as you say, other sectors can become very overwhelmed when we go to them with a list of child protection questions, we want them to incorporate into their assessment, but also just working with them to look at what data they are already collecting. And again, how can we interpret that and use it for um, child protection programming? Um, we had considered as a kind of parallel session to this, um, during this, um, uh, this priority session in, but in the multi-sector group that's happening right now under that priority to have a specific conversation around how do we integrate um, child protection into other sector assessments or how do we have integrated, improve our integrated multi-sector assessments. And I think it's something that we kind of need to have further discussions around um, specifically in relation to um, some of the conversations happening um, on pillar four. So really key, important points. Um, and maybe we can move on to the 1B then. So what mechanisms um, are needed to generate and share learning and evidence Great. on the cost effectiveness of pri primary prevention programming. This kind of builds off of what was in 1A. So if you can start adding your responses to this question. And Catherine, if you want to add something. Yes, sorry to interrupt. I know that there's been a few of you who have joined um, like recently, so you might have missed 1A. So I'm just going to drop the link um, on what we're working on it into the group chat. And so if you can just follow that link and it will take you to this group map where you can see in the green box, it asks a question that Selena has just posed. And basically to add content there, you just click on um, the little plus button, uh, button, not, not bottom, and uh, type in uh, your content and press enter and it'll add it there. And after a little while, um, you'll start seeing everyone's responses um, there and we'll have a little discussion on what you've written. Um, and that's what we, if you entered late, that's what we were discussing. We were discussing the question posed uh, for 1A, which was similar, but just not on the cost effective list. And to add while you're thinking um, of your answers, this came up um, in working on the framework of action in that are there two different levels of how we can measure cost effectiveness um, and the question was, is there something we can do? The framework of action focuses on the program management cycle, you know, on program managers and, and you know, a specific program or project. Is there something that can be done at, at that level um, to try to collect information around cost effectiveness? Or is it more that we can do kind of on an interagency or larger scale where we need more you know, research and, and um, um, or kind of analytical studies and, and putting um, together different um, data from different contexts and different um, types of work. So just to think about, is there something we can do at the program project level? Because that has kind of stumped me a little bit, um, as well as what can we do as, a, as the Alliance, as a sector? I'd be interested to hear if any of your uh, work at your individual agencies that you're working with have um, do cost effective analyses or or um, or measuring the cost effectiveness of your programming and how you're doing that. Um, it'd be interesting to hear from you. Um, it looks like. Um, can please continue to add, but uh, if anyone wants to unmute themselves and maybe speak to one of the points that they have mentioned, or if they have examples 
they'd like to share from um, from your work at your own agencies. Please, um, please feel free to raise your hand or speak up. It looks like uh, producing investment cases, measuring cost of inaction, very important. I guess the question is, yeah, how, how kind of looking at how we do that, um, conducting cost effectiveness analyses. Um, I guess it's also kind of speaking to looking at similar programming initiatives across contexts, and then uh, not only facilitating evaluations to look at effectiveness, but also uh, in general, but the cost effectiveness um, and doing kind of comparative analyses across contexts as well to determine cost effectiveness. Um, so I think we can maybe move forward to, we're going to also rank and prioritize uh, what is in 1A and B. Exactly, so maybe we can start with 1A. Um, well, maybe Matt can make his screen bigger for 1A um, and everyone in their own screens can, can start with that. But what you'll see is that to the far right of each point, um, you can click on the little gray bar there and you'll be able to rate it in terms of impact. Uh, you can drag it towards the low or the high side as well as feasibility. And, um, and so everyone um, will be able to, to do this. And after that, after we give you um, say, I would say about three minutes to do so, um, we will go on to results where it will um, cumulatively um, give you the, uh, give us the um, cumulative results of, of everyone's inputs. Um, and we can see where, um, where people think these things lie in terms of feasibility and impact. So um, yeah, over to you to, to rate or rank those things for the next three minutes or so. Um, I'm not sure who added the presentations at this Alliance meeting is a good start, um, which I agree with. And it's something we've been trying to kind of find ways for members of the AIM working group to more systematically share learning and knowledge from, um, from their programming and something we kind of always struggle struggle with. I rated that one as very feasible since we're done. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so there's quite a lot in 1A and I'm aware that some of you um, might sort of want to reflect on them before ranking them. Uh, um, so maybe it's useful and check in with uh, Selena and Susan. Uh, if you would like to, you can also, uh, if, you, if you've finished, you can move on to 1B as well. So we can rank those and we can uh, uh, accumulate the scores all together. So, yes, thanks Matt, that's great. Right. No problem. Yeah. So, so if you're still on 1A, no rush. If you've completed and you've done your feasibility impact, then feel free to move to the green box, which is one uh, B, uh, um, and and do this and repeat the, uh, repeat the process again. So Matt, you can take us on to on to results then. Absolutely. Let me just move my screen back over here, and if I then buzz this into results, we can see that for 1A. Tell me if it's useful to zoom in. I'm showing both at the moment. Uh, so what this has done is it's accumulated everybody's 
different um, different scoring opinion views uh, and so on and sort of um, rank them. Well, this one's an anomaly out here on its own. Um, but this is the accumulated. So let me share um, the first one with you. So it's interesting that um, just looking at the The ensured knowledge is analyzed, summarized, translated, disseminated, seems to have high ranking, but then it's not at the top. Mm. There you go. Yeah. Okay, uh, great. Yeah. Apologies. Okay. Just to say, I really like this first one to focus on kind of how we communicate and use storytelling and simple case studies. And I see that, I mean, that's also very feasible and something we can do, we just don't always do it. Um, so I really like that one. Yes, yeah, something, speaking to the point of, about sharing learning, and I know the Child Protection Minimum Standards Working Group had requested some time ago from their members um, to share case studies. And it's something that is very feasible and simple to do um, in general, but as, as kind of an interagency network like the Alliance, we often struggle to have members actually um, share um, case studies with us and across members or to uh, present findings and kind of showcase uh, findings on effectiveness of programming or a research study that has been facilitated at the individual agency level. So while it's kind of very simple, it's also something that we kind of entirely rely on our members um, kind of coming to the alliance and sharing that across um, with each other and uh, across different agencies. And I, yeah, mm -hmm. sorry, Susan. I was just going to ask if anyone has any thoughts or comments and looking at this that they want to share. And again, I think on 1B, it's the same. Matt, is that at the, is that the kind of the end results there? Let me on just, 1B. Let me just jump on. And then make this one larger, and then sort. So I'm working out loud, aren't I? Clearly, so <laughs> that's sorted by ranking. Yes, that's now sorted by ranking. So. Okay, so case studies wasn't at the top for this one. Yeah, and I noticed here that in general feasibility is lower for cost effectiveness than and kind of results effectiveness. The case studies, yeah, uh, ensuring case studies incorporate the cost implications. I think that is a nice way to do it. I, I, it, it is hard though to get case studies and then to add an extra element. We'd have to be very clear on how how that could easily and in a simple way be added. I think the comparisons between initiatives that target single um, or multi-risk protective factors um, versus more single issue initiatives would be really interesting. And I guess speaks to kind of documenting how we design our programs and are documenting and identifying um, risk and protective factors prior to implementation and using that to kind of, I think we often have a set of interventions that we repeat um, during humanitarian crises. And this kind of thinking about risk and protective factors, you know, is thinking in a way where as opposed to just, you know, responding to child labor, we're really looking at taking a step back and looking at what is causing child labor, how can we 
both respond to the risk factors, but then strengthen and build on the protective factors. And it would be really interesting to see the effectiveness of programming when we kind of target individual risk and protective factors, as opposed to the single issue initiatives kind of all together. And I think also quite feasible. Does anyone have any other points before we move on to questions two and then three? All righty, so it seems like there were no questions. Um, question two, it's a brainstorming question. So Matt, if I could ask you just to make that big for us, that'd be great. It's asking who should the Alliance work with on knowledge generation? So with this, we're not going to be ranking it or anything like that. It's just a place for you uh, to drop any ideas you have and afterwards we will um, discuss what's been placed there. So uh, like always, you just use the, um, you use the little plus bar to add your thoughts and we'll give you a little bit of time to do that and then we'll come back together to discuss. Mm. Maybe just we've got some responses already. So working with donors, academics, researchers, the university agency partnerships, designer and visual data specialists. That's great. Communication people. Yeah. So working both on the generating the evidence and then also how do we share it? Super. If. Or okay with that, maybe we can move to the last question. If you're still adding something, please feel free to do that while we move on. Okay, so the last question is, where should the Alliance focus their advocacy efforts for primary prevention? So we've looked at how can we generate evidence around effectiveness, and, um, and cost effectiveness, who should we work with to do that? Um, but where should we focus our advocacy efforts maybe within those, within effectiveness, cost effectiveness or, or something else? Um, yeah. So you can go ahead and add your thoughts in the map. And this is the Alliance kind of focus for the next few years out. Okay, so we've got some, some different takes. We've got social media. So that's the channel that we, we should use for our advocacy efforts. So I um, assume that means kind of going more widely to the public with the, the message or, or those that are interested um, in child protection and humanitarian action overall working with local, national, regional um, actors on advocating. I don't know if that's advocating with them or for them or um, for them to advocate for them to do prevention or advocate they should advocate to others. Long-term benefits of primary prevention, the US Congress, Focus on disseminating evidence on programs and approaches that work with practitioners and policies, policy makers and disseminate information on evidence gaps with fun, uh, funders and donors. Yeah. So which approaches work? And if you had like a key message you wanted the, the Alliance to really just get that message out um, what would what would kind of that one key or two key messages be? I have a comment about the for our question too, just in terms of knowledge generation, because it's um, of course everyone on the list is so important to engage with and to develop partnerships with. Um, it was interesting that. Alliance members aren't added because it's also the Alliance you know, as an interagency network really relies on members to generate knowledge and to share knowledge across members. So 
I would argue that should be one of the, the key, um, key kind of groups added here as well. And just speaking to the points that I had raised just about the challenges we sometimes face with of sharing knowledge across, um, across our members. But as we kind of move into the last few minutes of the of this session, does anyone have any key points that they want raised or emphasized? The purpose of the this session and the previous one, and the other priority sessions happening um, concurrently to this, is we we are going to be using um, a kind of aggregating all the data that from the questions we have posed and using that to inform um, our next steps and ways forward um, more broadly in terms of the strategy, but also in terms of the prevention framework. So um, we were being quite strategic in the questions that we were posing to you. So just so that you know, we are gonna be taking back your responses and discussing them further. Yeah, and definitely David, or what you've quoted there, response is not only generating the changes we want, but um, also prevention in terms of uh, progress. And as we've kind of discussed on day one, and I think some of the presenters in the thematic sessions over the last couple of days have also high highlighted um, we have an ethical responsibility as actors to prevent harm that is preventable um, before it occurs. So any final words from anyone before we wrap up? Yeah, I think, I think overall, just to build on that message was this idea around, I mean, to me, you know, we had the life-saving protection as life-saving as a kind of key thing from, from a few years back. And I know that we still use that, but to me, this is much more life-saving. I think we just, to focus on prevention, it, you know, life-saving is not just always putting the bandage on the, the wound, right? And, and so if we could somehow figure out how to message that you know tweak that message to me i i think that that would would work yeah if we can yeah. figure out how to present it in the right way yeah yeah thanks life-saving you know it's in the best interests of the child it's in line with do no harm and yet we kind of work around all of these principles and don't really engage that much in prevention work. And it absolutely is, is life-saving. And um, so thank you for raising that. And not only, you know, thinking about prevention as preventing harm in general, but also thinking if a child is, you know, for instance, engaged already in child labor, which is harmful, how do we prevent that child from moving into the worst forms of child labor, kind of have to think about it at different levels as well. Um, um, just to note in the chat, the chair has added a point on advocating for longer term interventions, which is something we've also talked about before. I think that's, yeah, longer term interventions, even in um, humanitarian settings is important. So thanks for adding that. And I think that's, that's a really important point. And it's kind of something that we sort of continue to tell ourselves as humanitarian actors that our programming is short because of the nature of humanitarian emergencies. And, but actually the majority of humanitarian crises are protracted, so they are long-term. So there really isn't a reason why we can't be engaging in more 
long-term programming and working alongside our development actor colleagues to do so. I think we tend to forget that. Okay, um, we've just got about a minute left so we can wrap up. Um, and Catherine has put in the chat the link again to fill out the, the Google form um, to, to note where you'd like to be involved or kept updated on the different strategy priorities. So please do make sure you, you fill that out and, and express interest in prevention it would be fantastic. Um, and otherwise, yeah, from my side, just to say thank you so much for all of your inputs. Um, and the aim is that these will turn into to concrete actions that the Alliance can take and promote within um, either the prevention initiative, but also the, the working groups and task forces um, throughout the Alliance. So thank you very much, Selena and Yeah, thanks everybody for joining. And I think um, there is another session in plenary for 20 minutes after this that um, Layal, who has been responsible for developing the strategy, is going to try to wrap up um, the key points and takeaways from each one of the parallel sessions that have happened, each of the priorities. So um, if you're interested in kind of hearing what the key takeaways were from the other sessions just now, um, please feel free. We'll have to go back into Philo and then reconnect to that plenary. So thanks everybody for joining and for adding all your inputs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a good afternoon, evening, rest of the morning. You too, bye-bye. Bye. Bye, see you in a few minutes.